we get started, I wanted to share a few brief housekeeping announcements. Uh, first, I would like to thank everyone who submitted questions in advance of tonight's town hall. We hope to address many of your COVID-19 vaccine questions over the next hour with our panelists. And if you have additional questions or need clarification, please use the Zoom, the Zoom Q&A function, excuse me. And as a reminder, this is a public forum, so anything that you type will be visible to others. Tonight's town hall is being recorded and streamed live on Facebook. Please feel free to share the link so that others can tune in, and we will paste that Facebook Live link into the chat momentarily. And finally, a recording of tonight's event will be available on the Montgomery County YouTube page, and we'll also send that link out to everyone who registered tonight once the video is uploaded. And now I will turn it over to our moderator to, to start tonight's call. All right, Kelly, thank you so much. Everybody, welcome to the Asian American Coalition COVID-19 Vaccination Virtual Town Hall. My name is Denise Nakano. I'm an anchor with KYW News Radio, and I'm so glad to be your moderator tonight. This is um, particularly important, of course, to the Asian American community when it comes to vaccines and vaccine distribution. So um, please, if you have any questions, just go to the chat function and we'll try to answer some of those at the end. Um, of course, this would not be possible if not for our sponsors. So I wanna mention them by name, Montgomery County Office of Public Health, Montgomery County Immunization Coalition, the Jason Medical Center, and also Health Spark Foundation. Thank you to our sponsors for making this possible. I'm going to introduce now to you the panelists. If each of the panelists, when I mention your name, if you can just give um, a, a brief uh, a minute or so, or, or less than that, just to introduce yourself briefly. Um, we'll start with Dr. Val Arkush, the chair for the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners. Dr. Arkush. Thank you. Good, after, good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so nice to be here with all of you this evening. I'm very much looking forward to answering all of your questions. I'm Val Arkush. I am chair of the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners, and that is the entity that oversees our Office of Public Health. And I'm also a physician. So again, just very glad to be with you tonight. And next on our panel is Dr. Angela Shen. She is a scientist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, also a vaccine policy expert. Dr. Shen. Great, thanks so much for having me. I'm a retired captain in the US Public Health Service, moved to the great city of Philadelphia two years ago, and I do research in access to services, disparities, and uh, operational uh, uh, um, immunization programs at, at Children's Hospital, as well as Teach at Penn. Really happy to be here. Great. And uh, next we have State Senator Maria Collette, who represents parts of Montgomery and Bucks County. Senator Collette. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I'm Senator Maria Collette. I represent the 12th District. I am also a registered nurse with a background working in long-term care. And I'm very proud to be the minority chair of the Senate Aging and Youth Committee. And I'm very excited to be here with everyone this evening. Okay. Now, before we launch into our questions, I wanted to introduce George Cho, uh, who's going to address some of the Asian American community issues, especially surrounding uh, the pandemic and also uh, the vaccine. George? Hi, uh, this is George Cho. Uh, I know you're expecting just the latest to speak this evening, but I'll be very quick. And the uh, Asian American Coalition for Healthcare is pleased to offer this town hall meeting, not only to educate our community, but also to share our issues with the regional decision makers so that we can work together to address some of these issues. So on that note, what are the, some of the uh, vaccination community issues that we're facing? Remember, uh, we are going through uh, 1A group and the current registration process, including the phone option, are so difficult for our Asian seniors and with the language of difficulty. And this is not surprising since the vaccination uh, registration process is a multi-step process. Not surprisingly, the Manco uh, recent data shows only 0.6% of uh, Manco vaccinated populations are Asian Americans despite the fact that AAPI community has a high acceptance rate for the COVID vaccine. On the other hand, it is not as bad as how it sounds. Uh, this is not a full story and we'll talk about that. And one concern though I do have is that Pennsylvania Department of Health's desire to significantly 
reduce the number of vaccine providers so will cause more challenges for the AAPI community. And AAPI seniors, not surprisingly, are more comfortable with the bilingual vaccine providers like the Jason Medical Center or Asian American pharmacies. It is not the size of these providers, but our seniors' comfort zone and their trust matters. We know many of our seniors use these providers to get their vaccines, but they were not included in the data that Dr. Bang Akush uh, uh, presents uh, recently. In addition, AAPI seniors also may be reluctant to know their race information due to the rise in racism against the AAPI community since the pandemics, which is a whole separate and significant issues that we are facing. From today's panel, we hope to address some of these issues or even discuss it. And without further ado, I'll pass it on to Denise so that you can now hear from our woman leaders and experts. All right, George, thank you so much. Um, you know, you, you may have heard it this morning or today on KYW News Radio because we had mentioned it, how Governor Tom Wolf had mentioned that anybody who is eligible for a vaccine will be able to get it at least scheduled an appointment, schedule an appointment by the end of this month, which is only really 15 days away. Yeah. Um, Dr. Arkush, can you give us the latest on the vaccine availability and also the timeline, especially for the 1A and 1B groups? Sure, I'll be happy to do my best, although I will tell you this is a rapidly evolving situation and we don't have a lot of firm timelines right now. So let me work backwards a little bit. Uh, last week, President Biden announced that the federal government has purchased enough doses of vaccine that by the end of May, there would be enough of a supply of vaccine to vaccinate everyone, every adult in the United States. So that was really, really good news. So that doesn't mean that the, vaccinate, the vaccine will be here and that everyone will be vaccinated by the end of May, but at least they were, there will have been enough vaccine produced that once it's shipped out and injected, there'll be enough for everybody who wants a dose. So that's really great news. And then working backwards from that, the president has said, and Governor Wolf has uh, is hoping to agree that by May 1st, we could really start to open this up and make you know most people eligible for a vaccine at that point. Now here in Pennsylvania, we've got a couple of um, challenges getting to that point. First of all, Pennsylvania has the ranks eighth in the United States uh, out of the 50 states. We rank eighth with the number of people who are 65 years of age and older. So we have a very, very large population in that 1A group, just simply by age. We also have a lot of healthcare workers in this state. We're, we're the home of a number of fantastic medical centers and uh, lots of healthcare workers. And then of course, there's the people who are under 65 with about a dozen uh, fairly common healthcare conditions. So in Montgomery County alone, at our best estimate, we've got at least 250,000 people in the 1A group. So this group is being vaccinated now, but we're getting very little vaccine into our county compared to the large number of people in this group. So at our current rate of vaccination, the current rate of vaccines coming into the county, we're estimating that it would be about four months before we could get through all the people in the 1A group. Um, now, Having said that, we're hoping that we're going to get more vaccines soon, but we don't have any certainty on that yet. So it's difficult for us to make appointments if we don't know how much vaccine we're going to have. On a separate track, the governor has made available some of the single dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So that one you get one shot and you're done. And right now that vaccine is available to teachers and educational support personnel. So that's really helpful to get that group of 1B workers vaccinated. Once those teachers are done, then the Wolf Administration is going to 
make that vaccine, that Johnson and Johnson vaccine available to some additional 1B workers, uh, grocery store workers, uh, police and fire, if they haven't already been vaccinated yet, food service workers, things like that. So it's coming and hopefully it'll be coming uh, for those 1B folks within about um, two to four weeks. So there's some bright light on the horizon, but we do still have a little ways to go yet. And Senator Collette, do you have anything else to add to that? Especially, are you optimistic about this time frame, um, especially with the governor's words saying, you know, by the end of this month, people will have their scheduled appointments, easing some of the, I think, the anxiousness surrounding, when am I going to be able to get vaccinated? Yeah, I mean, that's been the biggest question for sure. I think the good news is that, um, as Dr. Arkush said, we have seen uh, really uh, a great partnership between the governor, Department of Health, uh, state and local officials to really try to figure out the best ways to drive this vaccine out. One of the things that the governor did was establish the COVID vaccine task force. Uh, that has four legislators involved in it, two from the House, two from the Senate. And uh, they, meet by, uh, they meet twice a week to discuss the issues that are really on the forefront here. And they have tried to establish some subcommittees that are going to address some of the disparity that I'm sure we're gonna talk about uh, even in more detail later this evening. So the good news is that I have a direct liaison within my caucus to whom I can elevate these issues and concerns that are really specific here locally. And the good news is that our liaison is also from Montgomery County. So he is someone who understands the issues right here on the ground and is someone who is in that room at the table advocating for us. So when we hear about the governor really uh, saying that the next batch of J&J &J doses that are coming in are going to be earmarked to help us figure out how we're going to uh, really reach those 1A recipients, those eligible people to make sure that we're really targeting those people, then I have you know, strong confidence in the fact that we have an advocate in that room saying here in the Southeast, we really have a significant need for those J&J &J doses. And we'd really like to see uh, you know, our fair share down here. And we'd really like the ability to manage them here within our county because we have an incredible uh, Department of Health. We have uh, our incredible county commissioners who have really worked hard to stand up wonderful clinics for our community and can do so in even greater quantity when we have those doses coming into our county. So that's been my push. It's been what we in the legislature have really been working for, making sure that we have a really good give and take with the governor and with the administration and the Department of Health so that they can understand the issues specific to our communities and how those translate at the state level so that the doses we get, uh, the doses we need are the doses we get. Okay, and speaking about the J&J &J vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson one-dose vaccine, uh, this question is for Dr. Shen. Um, please comment on the J&J &J vaccine, the efficacy, the impact against the variants, and then the safety as well. So when it's your turn, you should take the vaccine that's offered to you. Largely, I think the key takeaway that is really useful is that all three vaccines that are currently authorized under emergency use, the Pfizer one, the Moderna one, and the J&J &J one that you know, all three of them are 100% safe and effective at decreasing hospitalizations and decreasing deaths. So it's really difficult as I get a lot of questions, as I'm sure you do as well, to kind of compare them head to head. And the main reason for that is because they weren't tested head to head. They had different clinical trial designs. They had different endpoints. Uh, kind of throwing in the Asian background that I am, it's kind of like comparing apples to mangoes. While they're both fruit, they're not exactly the same thing. And so I think the key takeaway around the J&G &J vaccine, if you're offered that one, or if you're offered the Pfizer one, there's the most likely that you won't be able to have a choice. You should take the one that you're offered. Okay. Uh, we kind of grazed over this, but we're going to get a little bit more in depth into the disparity issues with vaccine distribution. Um, and uh, Senator Collette, what steps um, are our local government officials taking to address the low vaccination rates in our region, especially among the Asian American Pacific Islander community? I, again, to mention what George had mentioned earlier with the statistics, you know, 0.6% in Montgomery County when it makes up about 7.7% of the population. In, in the county. 
um, it seems like there's disparities kind of, uh, you know, pretty much across the state. How is that being addressed? What progress is being made with talks on the state level? And then what are the next steps? So I'm going to um, defer to our county commissioner to talk about what, what's happening here locally to address the disparity. But what I can tell you about the state level is that one of the biggest things we've done is really elevate this issue. In fact, just a couple of days ago, I authored an email to the liaison, uh, to my liaison on the task force, talking specifically about this disparity that uh, George brought to my attention and said, hey, we need greater resources here. We need to make sure that our providers who are bilingual, our providers who can reach out and have relationships with these communities, are able to continue getting doses here. Uh, the Department of Health has talked about having a lot of different providers around our state that have applied to become uh, vaccine distributors and, and to give vaccines, to administer the vaccines. What we're seeing now is sort of a paring down of that and they've established some guidelines uh, in order to make sure that they are really getting vaccines to providers that are able to get the doses into arms quickly. What we don't wanna see happen with that paring down is uh, removing a provider like the Philip Jason Medical Center. We wanna make sure that we have providers who are bilingual, that are known in the community, that are trusted in the community, that we have them still getting doses so they're able to continue reaching out. The other thing that we've been trying to do is making sure in my office specifically is uh, answering any uh, questions that we have from people coming, uh, you know, from our constituents that might need help navigating the different systems that they have to uh, try to become a part of, whether it's a, a retail pharmacy provider, whether it's even uh, trying to figure out how they can sign up through the county. And I know that our county has worked really hard to make sure that we're addressing whatever those barriers might be, whether it's a language barrier, whether it's a technology barrier, uh, whether it's a, a barrier to location and getting access to that vaccine. So at the state level, we're really elevating what's happening here in the local level to make sure that we are continuing to see doses uh, really get to the providers that are able to reach this community, but also so that we're able to really help the constituents in the area, people that need this vaccine. We wanna make sure that they're able to navigate these complex systems that have to be complex to ensure that uh, you know we're, we're really keeping on top of the doses that we're getting and that we're administering them effectively and appropriately, but that do often, because of their complexity, make it even more difficult to access. So there are several things in the works there, but I, I would love to uh, turn it over to Dr. Arkush to give us a, a better perspective on what the county is doing uh, with the, the, the help that they are getting from the state, uh, whether it's robust enough or not. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Senator. So uh, we've been doing a number of things. Uh, first of all, it starts with education. And so forums, town halls like this tonight are extremely important. Uh, we also have a number of materials that have been translated into a variety of different languages. And we're always happy to do additional translations and help provide materials. We uh, work very closely with the Montgomery County Immunization Coalition and uh, work hard to make sure that we get information out in a way that is easily understood and culturally appropriate to all of our many, many different communities here in the county. Uh, as Senator Collette said, it's very important to us that we make sure that uh, certain particular providers do continue to receive vaccine because everyone needs to be able to trust the provider that they're going to and particularly able to speak and ask questions in a language with which they're most comfortable. It's critically important that anyone getting a vaccination or any medical procedure or treatment is able to ask all the questions that they need to ask and then get an answer back in a way that they can fully understand it. So keeping making sure that bilingual providers are do have access to this vaccine is very, very important. We've also worked with Jason to solve some very practical problems um, to make sure that they had access to freezers 
for that ultra, ultra cold storage that is needed for the Pfizer vaccine. So we want the Jason Center to be able to say yes to any vaccine that's offered to them. And they didn't have freezers on site, so we found a way for them to make sure that they could get no cost access to freezers. Uh, the county has started with some mobile vaccine clinics. And we are starting with some of our most uh, uh, vulnerable communities of seniors. And once we move through that group, we're uh, very interested in working with community groups to set up other uh, uh, sites for seniors in particular. And that creates a really nice opportunity to partner in vaccine clinics where we can make sure that there are bilingual providers and that uh, the word goes out to individuals uh, that in a, you know, in a particular community group, for instance, that will be there that day and that there are people there uh, that will be able to easily converse with them. And then we have also uh, made available appointments by phone, knowing that not everybody has good internet access. If people do have good internet access, all of our pages have a Google Translate button on them. So the, the registration pages and things like that can be easily translated. And then we have a phone registration and that phone number is 833-875-3966. And that's available Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we do have language line on that phone line. So there are 120 languages available to the individual who makes that call. They just, they just have to say which language they would prefer to converse in. So those are some of the steps that we've taken. Great. Now, the AAPI community has had some issues with the rise of racism in the Asian American community, and that could maybe add to why some people might be hesitant to put the race information on their vaccine forms. Um, can you comment on the racism concern and also why it's important to have that race information um, during registration? Well, first of all, I just want to state clearly that that racism is not acceptable here in Montgomery County. Uh, we have spoken about this a number of times throughout the pandemic. We saw some of these similar issues come up early in the pandemic when we first had the virus here. And I just, again, want to reiterate on behalf of myself and my colleagues that uh, that is unacceptable to us here in Montgomery County. And we will always stand with the API community and uh, absolutely abhor any, any attacks on the API community. Uh, so what we have noticed when it comes to reporting race, and then let me just explain how this works. When an individual signs up for their appointment on the, on the website or by phone, they are asked their race. That race question is not a mandatory question. We do not want to deter anyone from making an appointment. And we do understand how sensitive this information is, but it's not because the question's not mandatory. We are finding that one out of every five people that makes an appointment is not sharing their race with, uh, with us. And so it's actually very hard for us to know how we're doing. Our goal is to make sure that we leave nobody behind in our community. And one of the tools that we use to determine things like where should we take our mobile clinic? Should we open up a location in a particular part of the county? One of the most important tools for that is by understanding the race and the ethnicity of the people we've already vaccinated and then compare that with that population in our county so we know if we're about right. You know, if 7.7% of our county residents are identified as being in the API community, we wanna make sure that's how many we're vaccinating. But if one out of five don't give us that information, it's really difficult for us to know how we're doing. I do want to reassure everyone that we understand how sensitive this information is, particularly right now. That information is being used only for this purpose. So it is not being shared in any way outside of the Pennsylvania Department of Health System. And it's just simply a tool for us to know if we're reaching all the members of our community. So we really would encourage people to please let us know how you identify in terms of your race and your ethnicity. Any additional uh, comments, Senator Collette? I was just gonna add that that's why it's so important that we have 
culturally sensitive and, and, and recognized providers like the Jason Center. You know, it just really does underscore why it's so critical that we have um, access, uh, you know, through Philip Jason so that members of our community, I can certainly understand their reluctance and members of our community who are feeling that reluctance have a provider that they can go to, that they trust, uh, that they feel really comfortable going to to get this vaccine. So that does just underscore that need even more. Okay, um, and Dr. Shen, is there any additional comments that you'd like to make, anything that you've seen in your line of work about uh, the racism concern and just being uh, there in, uh, you know, at CHOP and in the community? I think that I just echo what uh, Val, uh, Dr. Arkush and Senator Coletta said, that while in terms of the reporting for vaccination, it's a required field that field could be empty. And in the last uh, session, I was just, came out of, a lot of that is really important to see how well we're doing. We're at a point at a cusp where we will have the equation flip, where we will have more supply than demand, hopefully in the upcoming months. And when we hit a certain saturation point of all folks seeking vaccine, getting the vaccine, it'll still be really important for public health and for the community to seek out areas in the city, in the state that are under vaccinated or unvaccinated. Under meaning you weren't fully vaccinated with both doses that you're required for full protection and unvaccinated meaning you haven't gotten any. And so recognizing that we need to not only get people vaccinated to protect themselves, we need to get a large proportion of the of the of the state of the country vaccinated to protect through something called herd immunity. Vaccines are really neat because they not only protect the person who got vaccinated, but they protect those around them when there's enough people who got vaccinated. So that those who can't, like those who are contraindicated, those who are too young, or those, for example, who might be on chemotherapy and can't get vaccinated are then protected through this kind of blanket of protection. And so having as much data for decision-making, data for action is really important for public health and for us to kind of get out of the jam we're in now in the pandemic. Uh, the Senator, um, this, this question is for Senator Collette and Dr. Arkush. In regards to, it's difficult enough for mainstream seniors to register, and it's been in a long ongoing process for many of them, and almost impossible if you are a senior who has limited English uh, speaking abilities and in, in the AAPI community. So uh, the question is, what's being done to overcome this uh, particular challenge? Well, I'll start with that. So as I mentioned earlier, we do have a phone registration with Language Line. I know that can be a little bit awkward, but it, at least that is available. And let me just share that number again. It's 833-875-3967. And uh, we are always eager to work with partners like the JSON Center to uh, find ways that we can work together to help um, get folks registered. So uh, if there's any additional ways that we can partner, um, any suggestions that you have for how we can make this easier, we are so open to hearing from the community about what we can do better to make this more accessible. Obviously getting vaccine to the JSON Center is a great way to do that because we are then able to use their resources to reach the community. Uh, but if there's other ideas, uh, we are sure open to hearing what they are and we want to partner to get those done. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely in agreement with all of that. And, and the first thing I can say at the state level is we're not doing enough, that's for sure. So there is always more that can be done. The administration has said that they're working on different marketing campaigns. Uh, I know that the COVID vaccine task force has put together several subcommittees dealing with the issues of race disparity. And I know that the first two that have been put together deal with uh, the African-American community and our Latino community. And I have asked uh, our liaison to consider having a subcommittee for our AAPI community so that we can get these issues discussed. We can have uh, people like George and Dr. Jayraj on that subcommittee talking about the need here in our community and giving those ideas directly to the Department of Health. 
You want to do a marketing campaign? Great. Here's what's going to help with that marketing campaign. Uh, you want to open up access? Great. Here are the providers that really could provide good access to our community. So that's been my goal really at the state level, trying to elevate this issue so that we are getting our COVID vaccine task force to begin on finding the solutions and implementing those solutions uh, sooner rather than later. Because as Dr. Shen said, I know we can't all wait until the tipping point comes and there's more doses than people in need. But until we're there, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. And uh, one of the biggest things we need to do is address this uh, barrier to access. Great. So Dr. Shen, let's uh, talk about some of the vaccine questions. One being, what happens if you're able to get that second vaccination on time? If you have a Pfizer vaccine, can you go to Moderna? Can you mix the two? And, um, and the people are saying maybe you can because it has the same, same mRNA technology. What are your thoughts on that? Really great question, really thoughtful question. So there's a little bit of wiggle room at that end of that question where you talk about what's on time. And so that wiggle room is about a four day grace period. So um, this means that there's a range. So after you get your first shot for Pfizer, you can get your second dose between 17 and 25 days. So with that same four day grace period for Moderna, it means you have between 24 and 32 days. What's been really efficient in many or virtually all the vaccination programs is that folks are trying to schedule that second appointment before you kind of leave there. I also, I also recommend, which I did for my parents and the Asian American community in California, to take a picture with your phone of that dose as well as put it in many places and when that's scheduled. And so that on time has a little bit of wiggle room. The, the second part of your question uh, uh, so, so if you, if you, you should try to get your second dose within that time period. And if you are past that time period, which is kind of a natural follow on question, you should get your second dose as soon as you can thereafter. You don't have to restart the series. Um, you just need to get your second dose as soon as you can. And so it's really important to do that because you're not fully protected until you have both doses of vaccine for the two dose regimen. Uh, with regard to kind of the mixing and matching or the swip swapping, you should really try to get the same vaccine that you got the first time. The clinical trials were based this way on this. The clinical trials were studied this way. Um, there has been CDC guidance or there is CDC guidance that says, you know, in exceptional circumstances, because the technology to make those two vaccines were the same. Uh, um, and so, you know, in that case, the two doses should be separated at least 28 days if different brands are used. You shouldn't go in thinking that that's a possibility in the sense that that's a good idea. You should try to get the same vaccine you got the first time and the way that a lot of programs are pairing that so that you get the same one that you got the first time. So take away a four days wiggle room and get both the same. I think you're on mute, but you look great on mute. Thank you. It's like slipped into to mute now. Um, so talking about the vaccine and, and also the different variants that we've been hearing about, should we get a booster? And if so, when would that happen? Also a very good question. Uh, it's definitely on the radar. Both the, I don't know if that's me. I'll try to fix that shortly. So there are studies looking at a booster dose. So that booster dose means that a third dose to the current regimen. There are also studies looking at a second generation vaccine, meaning a different vaccine than the one that you initially got. So a third dose perhaps is the same one that you got. So those studies are being done now. The big takeaway around variants is that it's on the radar with regard to keeping an eye on the variant or the different types of variants because viruses mutate all the time. It's just a matter of when they elevate to be of concern. And then the second is that vaccine manufacturers are starting to take a look at vaccines and its effectiveness against them. At this juncture, it's good that both pieces are on the radar and there isn't uh, uh, um, enough concern with regard to uh, the current vaccination program. Um, but def definitely it's on the radar um, and folks are monitoring that closely. Scientists and others are monitoring that closely.
keeps slipping into mute for me. Uh, I don't know if someone's trying to tell me something. No. Uh, so Dr. Ara Amarkush, many vulnerable seniors who speak limited English have some questions and I feel more comfortable going to clinics that are bilingual. So the question is, um, are there any plans to accommodate this such as mobile clinics? Yes, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are fully supportive of uh, clinics like the JSON or centers like the JSON Center uh, continuing to get vaccine. I think that's very, very important to ensuring that particularly uh, individuals that are comfortable in a particular language are able to get their medical care where that language is spoken. And uh, we will continue to partner. We will continue to advocate on their behalf to make sure that they do get vaccine. And if there is not enough vaccine, then we will work together to try to bring vaccine to them or bring some of our hospital partners to the table. Uh, the vaccine for the most part right now is coming to the county health department and to our hospitals here in Montgomery County. There are a few pharmacies that are getting vaccine, but, but very, very few, uh, hardly any doctor's offices. And then places like the Jason Center are getting occasional deliveries. So, as this progresses, hopefully there'll be more vaccine available and everyone will be able to get more. But if that does not turn out to be the case, then we will work in partnership as we have been to try to make sure that doses are available at places like the Jason Center so that people can come uh, to a place like that where they're comfortable. Uh, Senator Collette, I know you had talked about this a, a little bit, but uh, explain again the role of the state legislature in the vaccination process and also the availability of vaccines and clinics. And what was mentioned too was that Pennsylvania is looking to downsize or reduce the number of providers, which would really significantly impact the AAPI community. Um, so what can be done? So it's a really great question. And the legislature um, as an elected body doesn't have a specific role in this uh, procedure, in this process that's really under the purview of the Department of Health and uh, the governor. But what the legislature can do is uh, really propose legislation that might be helpful. And hopefully that'll spur the administration and the Department of Health to, to take actions. One of the things that my, uh, some of my colleagues and I introduced in the Senate, and there's a companion version in the House, is this idea of a centralized vaccine registry, something that we can all uh, sign up for, maybe we won't get our appointments through that, but in the secretary, the acting secretary has talked very recently about making sure that, and we talked about this at the beginning of our call, by March 31st, uh, anyone who is a 1A eligible recipient who is on a waiting list would have an appointment by the end of this month. Maybe their appointment wouldn't be this month, but they'd at least be scheduled for an appointment. And my question for the Department of Health has been continually, um, you know, where is this waiting list? Because we don't have one centralized waiting list. That would be something that might be really helpful. The department has rolled out something called the Your Turn tool, and that is a place where people can go to check their eligibility. How wonderful it would be if that also collected information so that it could be a registration site as well. I used it this weekend. Uh, I am not eligible. I knew I wasn't going into it, but I wanted to see how the tool worked. And at the end, it just said, you're not eligible. Check back another time how great it would be if it had taken my information and said, uh, we'll let you know, number one, when you are eligible, and number two, when a provider within 25, 50 miles of you, someplace that I agree I can get to, has a dose available. Something like that. So these are the roles of, of our legislature to try to figure out where the barriers are in uh, accessibility to this vaccine, elevate them at a higher level to our Department of Health, and through the COVID vaccine task force so that we can take action on things that are going to be ultimately um, positively impactful to everyone in our community. When we talk about earmarking those Johnson & Johnson doses for people that are eligible 1A recipients, we've got 
got to make sure we can get to those people. We've got to make sure that we're able to, to alert those people. Hey, we have these doses and we're ready for you. One of the best ways we could have done that was through a more centralized process. We didn't take that approach early on. That doesn't mean that we still can't take that approach as we move forward. It's something I'd like our state to, to work on. I know it's something that would ultimately be beneficial when we're talking about uh, having all of these different places that people need to try to navigate to figure out if there's an appointment available, can they um, you know, get to the dose that they need to, and uh, oh, I'm getting ready to click on it and fill out my information and the appointment's gone just like that. So you know, all of these barriers that we're seeing to access, we really could try to streamline a little bit to make it easier for consumers, to make it easier, uh, such as we've talked about tonight, the people in the AAPI community who have language, technological barriers, accessibility, mobility barriers. We can do things that are going to ease those barriers, but we've really got to work uh, together to elevate those issues at a, at a bigger level so we can actually uh, make some positive change. Great. Um, there seems to be some confusion about what to do after you're fully vaccinated. So uh, Dr. Shen, Dr. Arkush, if you can address what needs to be done, what safety precautions need to be taken even after you're fully vaccinated. Uh, I'm happy to start. Uh, uh, loosen the cap for you. Um, so after you complete your series, whether or not it's a one shot or two shot, it takes about two weeks for your body's immune system to build up or to kick in. So you're most likely protected, though there's a chance that you can uh, 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 be more vulnerable. And you always have to kind of be cautious that we're not exactly clear about how well the vaccines work in terms of spread. And so if everyone's vaccinated, you know, you know, the CDC has recently released guidance about uh, hanging out indoors and private spaces without wearing masks and within six feet with others who are vaccinated. Um, there's a perennial question that comes, I don't know if perennial is the right word, there's a common question that comes through around grandparents uh, and spending time with uh, a grandchildren. And so that's been given somewhat of a green light if a vaccinated grandparents can see their and visit their unvaccinated children. I think that in a story that I did for, uh, for one news outlet, it really kind of short of answering a bunch of different vignettes and caveats about what you can and cannot do, which is very, very helpful and illustrative. I think for me and my advice, it, 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 in terms of guidance, it, it's really all about behavior and it's really all about exposure. You know, you may be vaccinated, however, um, you, you, your, your spouse may not be and your spouse may be taking care of an elderly parent. And so it's very contextual and it's about your behavior and your exposure, low, medium, high. You can tell I have an elementary schooler and everything is quantified that way as well as thumbs up and thumbs down. And so you yourself, it's very empowering to make that decision. That's what's, what's appropriate for you in your context relative to your behavior and relative to the exposure profile, if you will, that you have. And so we, um, we know that we should still wear masks. We know that social distancing and masks are really remarkably empowering and they're extremely cheap interventions. They're non-pharmaceutical interventions. Even acute masks cost you less than $10 and it's extremely powerful. It's very unlikely that a droplet will spread from your nose, your mouth, six feet across through your mask onto Dr. Val's mask in, in terms of transmission and infection. And so flagging that I think is also really important because you have some control there by which you're empowered on what you can and cannot do. And you also know that if you're around high risk people who haven't been vaccinated, I have in-laws, my brother, you know, they, they, their spouses go in and are essential health workers. They have higher levels of exposure and risk. And so it's really important to know and understand that you're not in it alone and you're not an island unto it yourself. And so the behaviors and the actions that you take affect those around you and those others, that table next to you at the restaurant per se. And so you don't know if that person is high risk. So that person probably should be there if they are. And so all these things kind of come into play in that kind of calculus around behavior and exposure and what you do affects others. And we're very much in this kind of collective good or social responsibility, whether or not we like it or not. Dr. Arkush? Dr. I don't think I really have anything to add. 
uh, other than until we reach a high percentage of people in this country being vaccinated, you know, at least 75%, maybe more, we do just need to still be careful. And uh, in addition to everything else that Dr. Shen said, I would just add that always remember that being outdoors is safer than being indoors. And so particularly if you're choosing to see friends or relatives that have not yet been able to be vaccinated, even if you've been vaccinated, it's just safer for everybody if you can do an activity outdoors rather than indoors. And happily, that's going to get a lot easier very quickly. So I am looking forward to that. Denise, you're muted. You're muted. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and take some questions from our audience, people who have been so kind as to chat in and, and chime in um, about some of the questions they have. And we've got Stephanie who says, how can we best support the Asian community during this time, particularly in the event of racism due to rhetoric around the pandemic? Is there anything that we can do as it pertains to the vaccine? That's coming from Stephanie. Anybody who can, uh, who can address that? Well, well, I'll start. You know, I think that one of the things that we can all do is not it, it is to be responsible in our words, in our social media postings, um, and how we just treat one another. And so I think if you're walking down the street, if you just look kindly on everyone who's walking down the street opposite you, that's a great first step. If you see something on social media that's just clearly racist, you know, call it out or just say, you know, you don't have to pick a fight on in social media, but just say, I really don't think that's true. And, uh, you know, let's get some facts here. Um, I think we just, we all have a responsibility to each other and to stand up for all members in our community and call this out when we see it. And of course, if there's anything that's really threatening to any individual, should never hesitate to call 911. In Montgomery County, you can call 911. You can also text 911 if you're on a Montgomery County located cell tower. And so if you're in a situation where you don't wanna say something out loud, you can always text it. So I, I just think it's important that we all stand together. And events like this tonight are, are one way that um, I wanna send that message that we are all in this together and we will all get out of this together and we have to take care of each other in order to get through this. And so again, as I said earlier, there is just no place for this in our community. Let me add to that. You know, the virus is really agnostic to not only borders, it doesn't really stop at, where, where am I, Delaware County or Montgomery County or, or even Pennsylvania. So it's agnostic to geopolitical borders. And so racism amongst, you know, a, a number of other issues really only helps the pandemic. And so I think that's something, whether or not it resonates with others or not, the bug doesn't care what color you are. Very good point. Uh, Senator Coletta, anything you'd like to add? You know, I don't think I could uh, say anything better than that. Uh, I would say that all of us have a responsibility to listen as well, learn uh, from our neighbors and our communities. Uh, for those of us that are able to volunteer, maybe to, to drive people, to help them navigate uh, some of these sites, please, let's, let's do that. If you have the, the capability to volunteer, to help people navigate websites, to help them schedule appointments, then let's do that because um, you, you heard Dr. Shen, you heard Dr. Arkush, the more people we get vaccinated uh, as quickly as possible, then the better off all of us in uh, our community will be. Dr. Shen, we have a, a brief question from somebody who's asking that uh, somebody got a, a vaccination and it appeared not to really, they felt like it rolled off their arm and they didn't really fully get vaccinated with that first dose. What should they do? Should they uh, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but yeah. um, it, it sounds like they, oh, go ahead, please. Yeah, should they go for the first dose again, get it get it redone, or should they just go on and and go on with the continued second dose when it's time? So um, th they should talk to their healthcare provider, you know, in terms of describing what exactly happened in terms of rolled off. Uh, uh, and, and, and for sure, they should go in for the second dose. 
and whether or not that has kind of an, an additional consequence uh, in terms of revaccination or what that guidance is. Provider, together with guidance of CDC, as well as uh, uh, I don't think our website has anything on that, um, should be able to guide them. There's also kind of uh, clinical access to guidance through the CDC by which these types of perhaps more outlier questions can be asked on whether or not the decision is or the recommendation is to revaccinate or not. So at minimum, for sure, they should complete this series as is and then talk to the provider about that, by which they can get guidance on whether or not they should restart that series. Gotcha. Now, we've been hearing about Moderna having trials for kids as young as six months of age. So when would kids be vaccinated? What's the timeline for that? Uh, I, I'm happy to start if, if anyone wants to. So there are the manufacturers itself, as you noted. So, so first of all, vaccines are different than uh, other medicines because they're given to healthy people as opposed to other therapeutics are given to folks who are sick under a condition. And so the standard or the bar for testing and evaluating vaccines is higher because you're giving them to folks that are healthy. Having said that, the bar is also high in giving to children. So vaccines are typically tested first in adults, and then they do what's called de-escalation. So they go down in stages of younger ages. So um, enrollment has begun and I believe closed for older children. So this is the 12 to 18 group. And then I think you might be speaking of the Moderna trial that's enrolled the younger wee itty bitty children, uh, the three months and up or six months and up, I don't remember the time. So when they open for enrollment, they have to enroll all those children. And then the studies have to go on until the study ends according to what's called the protocol or the, or the, um, the playbook on, on what the clinical trial looks like. And then you have to wait a number of months after that, a minimum threshold of at least two months to take a look at what the safety data looks like. Uh, most likely the large preponderance of safety things happen in a relatively short period of time, six to eight months, not, not necessarily uh, uh, for, for kind of rare adverse events, but the large proportion of what will happen. And so that data is going to have to get taken a look at, and then I'll go through a process by which the FDA will evaluate that and ask their advisory committee, an independent group of experts, uh, as well as uh, uh, decide whether or not it'll go under an emergency authorization as with the others. And then the ACIP, a, a committee that advises the CDC, will talk about what the guidance for use is, just like these priority groups that we talked about. So all that will take time. I would expect that to be no earlier than perhaps the end of this year or more most likely next year. And this is assuming nothing kind of goes wrong. And so I've learned that people want to know an answer aside from there's a lot of stuff that happens. So that's kind of somewhat of my best guess, if you will. There's a number of things that may occur that we don't know when the trials go on. And there might be a number of things that the company might decide that they don't want to submit to an emergency way and they want to submit through kind of the regular mechanism. But largely it's something that uh, one, we know that has to be done because the indication is needed for children. Two is we know that um, that, uh, that, that, uh, that has to be done. And then two, we know that there's a process that's been very transparent that hopefully will gain and build trust because people view vaccinating themselves as adults differently than they view their own children, in some ways perhaps more protective. And, and that transparency in the process of how that's evaluated is important. And three, when, when that all comes up to being, um, still depending on doses and what things look like, there may or may not, hopefully not be a scenario like we are today. So all that takes time, hopefully end of this year or early next year, uh, particularly as folks are looking to policies and programs around back to school and a number of other things. Great, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. It'll come from Jill for uh, Dr. Arkush. And um, she asked, can you explain the J&J &J rollout in Montgomery County? When will it be distributed and will it be given out into phase 1A or 1B or both? And will the county give it out? Those are great questions. I will do my best to answer them, but I want to first say that we don't have 100% certainty uh, in terms of how the J&J &J vaccine is going to roll out. So I can tell you what's happening right now today. Right now, uh, the Governor Wolf through the Pennsylvania Department of Health is working with all of the intermediate units around the state to bring vaccine to teachers and educational support personnel. So here in, what, in Montgomery County, what that has meant is that uh, right now, and there, there, I think they have one more day of this, maybe two more days, 
There are 8,000 doses of Johnson & Johnson that have been brought into the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit, and those doses have been offered to both public and independent school teachers and educational support personnel, including bus drivers. And those individuals have all been tiered. We asked the schools to tier their employees uh, months ago in anticipation that this day would come. So they're starting with the teachers and the support personnel that are in classrooms with children as the highest, you know, highest priority to be vaccinated, bus drivers, people like that, and then they're moving down from there. So uh, 8,000 doses is not enough doses to vaccinate all of those individuals in Montgomery County, the teachers and educational support personnel. So we do anticipate that at the end of the month, uh, the state will be getting additional vaccine Johnson, from Johnson & Johnson. And they will take from that allocation whatever is needed to finish up with all of the teachers and educational support personnel and then they are planning to make that available to additional 1B workers. What we've been told so far is that that would include any police or firefighters that have not yet been uh, vaccinated, grocery store workers, uh, individuals that work at food processing plants and uh, other agricultural, agricultural workers and a few other work categories. I think they're still defining those categories. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. Uh, we, we are hopeful that uh, we will, the county health department will be given those doses of Johnson & Johnson vaccine for those particular 1B work groups because we're ready to give it. Uh, we could start next week. We have large mass vaccination sites set up, ready to go, that are standing empty right now because we don't have enough vaccine to open them up. So uh, we have conveyed that to Department of Health and Pima, the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Association, which is working with us on this. So we're hopeful that we will actually get that so that we can make that readily available to people here in Montgomery County. The state is also discussing that they may not give it to the county health departments that instead they may set up separate regional vaccination centers and that particular question is still being debated. So at, in, in, at the Department of Health and with Pima. So I don't have a definite answer on that, but I will tell you that we are in the strongest terms advocating for that Johnson & Johnson to be given to our health department. So, because we know we're ready to give it, we could start on Monday if we just had the vaccine to give. Okay, Dr. Lepersh, thank you so much. And as we wrap things up, I'm gonna ask each of our panelists, starting with Senator Collette, just for a brief final thought as we uh, say goodbye and uh, thank everybody. Well, I wanted to um, thank the um, Jason Medical Center for putting this on. It is so incredibly important that we have town halls like this. I am so pleased to have had the opportunity to be here this evening with Dr. Shen and Dr. Arkush to answer any questions that uh, we could. And uh, please, if anyone has any other questions or if my office can assist in any way, please feel free to reach out to me, senatorcolette.com. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shen. Thanks so much. Um, I would give advice to folks to hang on there. It's really difficult to say the least, uh, but we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's absolutely scientifically remarkable not to just have one, but three vaccines against a bug that we didn't even know existed a year ago. Just for context, it takes 15 to 20 years to develop a vaccine around bugs that we do know about. And so if that's helpful, uh, knowing the cultures that are involved here that are commonly known for patience and perseverance, in terms of the long game, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and we're very close. Great, and Dr. Arkush. I just wanna thank uh, you, everyone here tonight for organizing this. I wanna thank George Che for being such a wonderful partner in this work along with Dr. Jay Raj. Uh, they are always there with us working together to help the community. It's been so wonderful to spend time with Senator Colette. We, we talk on the phone a lot, but we don't always get to actually see each other. And Dr. Shen, it's been so nice to meet you and really appreciate your being here tonight. Um, in addition to what my colleagues have already said, uh, both statements of which I completely concur with, I just want to add one more thing, which is a reminder that we really are all in this together. 
And I don't pretend to know every answer to every one of these questions tonight. And when I said earlier that I really hope that if you have suggestions for us, we truly welcome them. And so if there's ways that we can be uh, uh, do a better job of serving the community, we would love to hear what they are because we have resources, we have an amazing team of people and we wanna make sure that we leave no one behind in this vaccination process. So we thank you for your input and your help. We can't do this by ourselves. We need everybody listening to help us help the entire community so that no one gets left behind. Thank you. And so with some final comments, uh, Dr. J. Raj. Thank you, Denise. I'm going to, first of all, you know, thank uh, the MCIC, that's the Montgomery County Immunization Coalition, along with the health department, for really reaching out to the underserved communities. They've held four of these uh, town halls, the Afro-American community, the Latino community, the collaborative, now with the Asian American community, where the statistics are just a little dismal, I must say, so hopefully, this education you know, will help to enhance that. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, Denise, uh, you know, what a wonderful moderator you are. And of course, our, uh, Dr. Akush, our uh, Chairman of the Commissioners, uh, uh, Maria Collet, the Senator, and Dr. Shen. And you, uh, all three of you have just uh, educated us so much you know, in this uh, short uh, period of time. Um, I also got to uh, thank you know the Asian Amer the Asian American uh, community to uh, to be able to come together because we cannot hold this kind of town halls for each and every small small communities, but together I think you know we succeed. Just one or two more things that I just wanted to comment, uh, sort of summarizing you know what uh, our panelists have said. You cannot do it alone; it's a community effort. President Biden has said that uh, July 4th, hopefully it will be an important day where we can have some family gatherings, small family gatherings. But for that to happen, um, we have to reach out. I must say, you know, in the North Pan Lansdale area, we have a very strong relationship with all the smaller communities. And uh, each one of us has spent a lot of time, you know, reaching out uh, as much as we like the government, uh, Senator Collider and Dr. Akush, we do believe, you know, the, the ultimately the people have to take charge. You have to reach out to your communities. You know your community more than anybody else. And uh, my last thing I was going to say is uh, what I'm going to end up is by saying, we don't want to leave any arm uh, uninjected. Don't, le don't leave out any arm. With that, thank you, Denise. Thank you very much. I guess you give word to Kelly, I guess. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for taking part with your questions and all to our fantastic panelists. And this has been an informative and insight insightful virtual town hall. Thank you so much. And everybody have a safe and good night. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.